So again, uh, thanks so much for, uh, can everybody hear me fine? Uh, thanks so much for taking time out uh, of your busy schedule and uh, joining us today. Uh, so the, uh, the way I want to just basically kick this off uh, for today f for, and for the rest of the much smarter people than me are going to gonna talk to you about most of this stuff. Uh, I just wanted to give you a little bit of background as to where we are right now from a, from a storage portfolio perspective. Uh, we, we have uh, three bar, we have Nimble, uh, we have some data protection products in the portfolio, we have big data direct attached servers that handle a certain set of the market. Uh, but the goal over here is to just give you some sort of a problem statements that we have sort of adopted as our constitution. And then we go around over the next three years solving different problems within that, uh, uh, using that particular framework. Uh, if there is any questions, just stop me right then and there, and I can start to deep dive into that. Again, I'll, I'll try to keep it from a strategic perspective relatively high level. But if you want to deep, uh, want, want me to deep dive into certain areas that I'm aware of, uh, I'll be happy to do that uh, for you guys. I just wanted to throw this chart up primarily as uh, a workload map uh, that we see within uh, within our company as we go around uh, de de dealing with our customers. Uh, one of the one of the advantages that HPE has overall is that it's a it's a it's a full stack player all the way from compute, network, and storage. Uh, and then as as part of the as part of the software portfolio, there are a lot of uh, a sort of orchestration suites also available. But one of the advantages is that we we start to see all these gamut of workloads simultaneously now becoming uh, common within our customer base. And what I've tried to do it, try to look at it from a storage perspective as within the storage business unit, how we view these workloads and how we intend to service them and how they're sort of transitioning. So what you see is, you know, the first bucket is what we call the latency optimized workloads. These are your traditional applications, block oriented applications, very, very latency optimized. And Flash has done a lot of, uh, you know, optimization with deduplication compression to bring efficiency into this environment. But the primary focus of, of the, the first category is latency optimized block oriented workload. And that dictates a certain capability from a storage platform. Uh, secondly, what we see is how these work, the, these are the what, what I call mode two or next generation workloads that are coming up within uh, different uh, organizations simultaneously now. Uh, typically, these are bandwidth hungry uh, applications. Now, bandwidth is sort of a bandwidth hungry is sort of a generalization, but there are very, but there are a lot of few like Aero Hive and a couple of new key value stores that are also very, very latency optimized. Uh, but generally, when we start addressing the second category of workload, the, the, the requirements from the storage stack are, are bandwidth oriented. They, they read, they tend to read lots of data and then at the same time for processing. And latency is not as much uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, required uh, to be paid attention to. But, uh, you know, one of the common capabilities because they're very bandwidth optimized, uh, naturally people tend to put scale out uh, storage platforms in there. Then the third focus is basically it's a more of a uh, development paradigm. As customers start to deploy more and more newer workloads, newer application, uh, you know, cloud style of development, generally focused around PaaS services, generally focused around platform and object-based storage access patterns. And last but not the least, primarily because our HP's portfolio extends all the way to the edge server line, uh, where we're now seeing a lot of our customers now collecting a lot of data points at the edge. But and then on the uh, at the same point, uh, because there is only enough WAN bandwidth available, there's only enough uh, edge processing power available, they're now asking for pipeline-based processing at the edge. So give me a trained model, give me a trained set of algorithms that can pre-process some of the data that edge line servers are collecting at the edge, and then how do you sort of plug them back into the data center? Uh, what I'll also show on this slide is what we see as some of the requirements around workload mobility and why we see them. Uh, j just to frame the discussion for the, for the for the rest of the for the rest of the day, uh, so a lot of the times you'll see cloud native customers either uh, you know they, they, they're born in the cloud they have a certain PaaS or microservices based application development style but then oftentimes what we have seen in our customer discussions is a cloud native customer will start to get worried about the margin. Like when, if they're offering a service to their customers, their margin depends on what they pay the cloud provider and then the difference on top of it. As margin becomes really, really important for them and they want to expand that, they then start to think about what they have learned in the public cloud from an infrastructure and orchestration perspective and can they pull it back over on-prem. Right, and that's where container-based sort of stateless microservices which can fire up on any infrastructure becomes really, really important for them. 
But if they happen to carry some state in the cloud, then the storage environment receiving them on the primary on, on, the, on the primary data center on prem needs to be very aware of that, which is what we call workload aware container locality, right? So oftentimes you'll see uh, us talk about container uh, plugins for nimble storage and three part storage. A lot of it is being aware of what persistent storage is and the context of that data or LUN as it relates to that workflow. So that's really important. one of the very basic requirements as workloads move between public cloud and private cloud, especially when they are stateless microservices or stateful microservices. That's where Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes and Docker and container-based plugin integration becomes really, really important. Another common pattern that we see is application replatformation. So basically, customers that are on-prem, lift and shift has failed for them. And again, we see this because we're a full stack company, right? So a lot of the requirements for us are not just focused on the storage stack, but how it interacts with the rest of the stack that we provide our customers. So as customers do, sort of tried, tried the lift and shift to the public cloud, failed for various reasons, data gravity, uh, you, know, uh, you know, application became too expensive and it landed in the public cloud. So as they work towards replatforming their application, taking a monolithic application, breaking it down to microservices because that happens to be the best deployment model in the public cloud, Cloud, does the data follow uh, at, at the back? Especially when you start to do hybrid data development, and this is another example of container-based CI/CD pipeline that uses data on-prem and does test and dev in the public cloud. That is also a, a quite a big emerging workload that we see within our customer base. One of the very important workloads that is recently coming up again and again is what we call data transformation. And what I mean by data transformation is, so we have customers like Macy's, you know, Commonwealth Bank, a lot of these customers want to take their existing data, which is stored in their backups, which is stored in their day-to-day -day general ledger systems, and they want to do extraction of that data and populate some data lakes. Now, a lot of this is very, very manual. Sometimes they have to go back ages, recover backups, restore those databases, extract the right rows, columns, and populate the right databases, or the next generation applications to be able to do some analysis on that, right? So there's a lot of requirements that come about to, do, to be able to do this in an automated fashion. So the, and, and then last but not the least, as we have customers that we serve over the edge, there's this concept of a data pipeline, which is basically taking data which is generating at the edge, cleaning it up, throwing it away, and then bringing it back into either if the, if the source application it happens to be running in the private cloud or the public cloud and then start to process that, right? So what this gives you is, is a basic definition of where we see our customers' workloads evolving, what are those workloads doing? Most of them, they're coming up at simultaneously at the same time. What, what we are doing from a storage perspective is basically sitting at the bottom of the stack and looking up as to how these applications are consuming their data. One of the common themes across all of these things is data has a lot of gravity. Right? We're seeing a lot of emerging requirements now where customers are saying, hey, I'm on-prem. You can, in the very basic terms, take a snapshot of my data and replicate that snapshot into S3. But you know what? We have customers now telling us that's not good enough. Because most of the new style cloud developers are now landing in ElastiCache, Redshift, RDS. These are past services. They don't care about what the underneath storage is. All you do is you have a service and an application SLA with these guys. How do you populate your on-prem data into directly a past service in the public cloud? A very common use case for that with Microsoft Azure is running a SQL server on-prem, but then connecting that SQL server and populating the data in Azure SQL platform service. Because now if you talk to cloud-based development models and you tell them, hey, I'm going to take an EC2 instance and I'm going to install a SQL server in there, they're like, start staring back at you. Why, why would you want to do that? Why wouldn't you use RDS? It's just simple. And you specify your parameters, right? So a lot, as people have gotten more and more sophisticated on the cloud use cases, the requirements, which originally started from lift and shift, have now gotten very complicated in terms of how these workloads are being handled across private cloud and public cloud. So this basically just gives you a context of where we are and what we see in our customer environments. Any questions on that? Or do you feel the, the, the interpretation is flawed in any which way? I would love feedback on that. Because this generally dictates the strategy for us for, for the next couple of years. A question right there. How do you handle the performance requirements for these things? Because uh, you know, in the cloud, you can't guarantee performance. 
In the public cloud. In the public cloud. Yes, yeah, you're right. Performance. So, you know, in terms of like application requirements for IOPS or uh, high availability can be easily satisfied because redundancy. But for IOPS, you know, certain things require specific amounts. What, what, what's the, what's the thing? Uh, excellent question. So later on in the presentation, you'll see a, a big deep dive on InfoSight, which is uh, basically a self-monitoring, self-analysis uh, sort of SaaS service that we offer. But you know, and one of the things that you'll focus in that is what we call cross-stack analysis. Uh, the w w one of the missions that the InfoSight team is on is because InfoSight has its birth in the on-prem world. So when, when it comes over here by understanding tags about the application, by understanding workload characteristics, and by being able to compare those IOPS and characteristics, we're able to understand this world very nicely. And then we start to give recommendation on these latency optimized bandwidth. But where there is a lot of need for improvement is on this side of the world, is, is how your bandwidth uh, optimized application is working. And that's where cross-stack analytics for us, you will see now need to evolve from where they are right now and where we want to get them to. In an ideal world, we want to be able to instrument your applications and stacks in public cloud and on-prem to be able to give you a recommendation where it makes sense to run this workload from an IOPS and a latency perspective as well. What about that? It's, it's, it's non-secretous data, non-secretous between. Absolutely, so so the, the current, the, most of the, most of the uh, you know, siloed environments that you see, especially between on-prem and public cloud, it's completely asynchronous. Yeah, you, you, the, 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 we, at least as, as far as my understanding goes, are right now not focused on keeping the cloud data in sync with something on-prem. That requires insane amounts of bandwidth, and, and, you know, just, just, it's just better to go into a stateless development model rather than doing ma managing state on both sides. So moving on, uh, a couple of problems that I want. So, so if we if we understand that uh, uh, sort of workload map and how those workloads are uh, evolving over time, a couple of the problems that we are at least from stage one trying to focus on is 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 on the on the latency optimized word is what we call you know silos of data, you know uh, uh, data mobility and data gravity. Because if you just look at primary storage, right, and if you look at primary storage, secondary storage, backup. All of these don't talk seamlessly to each other because there is a backup administrator that is required. There is a primary data storage administrator that is required. Uh, secondary storage is an evolving category and it's sort of trying to collapse backup and test and dev workloads together, but it is yet another silo which is, which is coming up in, a, in an environment, right? So the goal from our perspective is when we look at just mode one uh, IT ops environments, one of the biggest challenges there is, is data silos and how data moves and, and nothing that reports across the entire environment. The modern day conversations are around terabytes and petabytes and gigabytes of data. There is no context around your data, right? When you look at, when, when you look, when you look, when you, when you, when, you, when an IT administrator has a conversation with the VP of ops or a VP of procurement, you just go, hey, I need to buy more storage. What do you need to buy more storage for? I don't know, we're full. What is, what, what is it that you're full with, right? So there is no sort of a gl global view of how you manage your silos in primary storage, right? And, and if you look at the backup software, backup software essentially just acts as a traffic cop. It will take data from one silo, and move it to the next one, and as it moves it, it charges gobs of money while doing that, right? Go, so, so this is giving birth to some of the concepts like maybe backup should just be a feature of primary storage, right? When you take a snapshot, it should be indexed, moved, and taken care of right at the same time. And I'll talk some more about that as we as we move along. And uh, but 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 these are the problem statements in which our strategy is sort of geared, and we will evolve on top of that. Then in mode two applications, from the big data perspective or the analytics perspective or new style of application development perspective, there are other challenges that come online, right? One of the biggest challenges about this is data manageability. If you just look at some of our larger customers that are doing risk analysis, fraud analysis, security analysis, they're running multiple data lakes that are not c c concatenated together. One of the biggest challenges is what to keep, what to throw away. Or if you just decide to keep everything, do you want to keep it in one or do you want to keep it in separate silos? So, and a lot of the mode two customers, like if you talk to Uber, Airbnb, LinkedIn, these guys are running distributed applications in production. So how do they back them up? How do they manage that? Currently, there are no solutions that I see available. Right? Secondly, how do you take the relevant data from your primary storage or your legacy storage systems and populate that data lake without involving thousands and thousands of dollars of professional services? 
And then last but not the least, as you start earlier pointed out, start to link your uh, on-prem environment with the public cloud. Maybe you have a monolithic application you want to do with cloud first mo modality on top of that. How do you move your data for test and dev other than shipping snapshots across? And even when you ship snapshots across, does the data instantly become usable in the public cloud because now you're doing cloud native development? That's a big if. And what you end up doing is, you end up taking your on-prem applications, virtualizing them in the cloud, and running data transformation jobs right then and there. And then on top of that, developing a test and dev environment. There is no seamless way to move data. Uh, so, so there's an application on-prem, which is using a primary storage environment, maybe LUN or a volume or an NFS mount. And then immediately start to use that application. What I mean by in the cloud is in a cloud native way. Not virtualizing your data appliance and running that in the cloud. Right? That's not cloud native. And because also that appliance doesn't naturally hook into many of the PaaS services that the cloud has to offer for, for maximum value of your money. So mobility and context. And, and the reason I say context again and again, especially with silos of data and orchestration in, in the middle of that is, what is context? Context is we, we're trying to attack the problem from a data lineage perspective. Let's just look at AWS. AWS has S3. It's got EBS. It's got various versions of EBS. It's got DynamoDB, it's got Aurora, it's got Glacier. These are just like nine data types that are in S3. Where is which data stored? And should it be there? And if you operate in a multi-cloud environment, or if you operate in a hybrid environment which has on-prem and public cloud, and people want to do on-prem production and in-cloud test and dev, or want to deploy certain applications in cloud and certain applications on-prem, where did the data originate? Do we act, can we actually, do we know of anything that can trace a production SQL server which got backed up on a data domain or, or a store one appliance in a backup tier, then got restored and fed into a data lake, and then from there it probably just got archived into S3, and then it got restored in S3 to be used as a test and dev environment in the public cloud. Can you trace this path right now? You cannot do that, right? And as the volume and the amount of data continues to increase, these are the problems of what we call a fractured data plane. We're dealing with data with workloads and silos. We're not dealing with data to drive outcomes right now. We want to be able to do that, but that currently requires a lot of professional services. There is no data plane that actually tries to address the problems of a multi-cloud environment where data lineage becomes really important. Where was this workload born? How did this workload change? Who all got access to this data? And now where does it reside? So the three basic questions that we want to answer, what is it that you store? How much of it do you store? And should you even be storing it in the first place? These are the very basic questions. Now the environment can be multi-cloud, it can be big data focused, it can be latency optimized, whatever. The goal is to be able to look at this holistically because all these three workloads are now running side by side in a customer's environment. Questions on that? Or questions on that fundamental problem statements that we generally will try to solve for over the next three years, which sort of sets our vision, sets our strategy, sets our execution mode. Oh, by the way, Either everybody agrees or they're like, this is hogwash. <laughs> Just to motivate you more, we have participation presence. But go on your <laughs> So be motivated to ask good questions. Better get them out. Or you can not ask any questions. I can take all of them for my kids. <laughs> <laughs> Right. So basically, you know, I, I just summarized this statement for you. Uh, uh, so, so the goal is, you know, the, the theme you, which you will see is echo again and again is intelligent storage. So what is intelligent storage? Intelligent storage, in, in our opinion, has three fundamental capabilities, right? It has the ability, it, it's, it's got data mobility built into it. And what I mean by data mobility is that when you define an intent about your workload, it should be able to get the data from its source workload and then be able to follow the workload from there onwards. Like if there is a test and dev hybrid pipeline that you want to develop between on-prem data production data that's running, snapshot needs to be taken and then transported to the cloud for your test and dev workloads to pick it up. And also keep in mind in which format you want to pick it up, right? 
because it might be just too expensive for you to take a virtualized nimble storage appliance and run it in the public cloud. It might be too expensive to be able to do that. For scratch space, for test and dev, you might want to just use EBS storage in, in AWS if you're using AWS or Google Block if you're in GCP. But does any on-prem storage device talk to block storage on the other side? That's a big problem. That's why we keep on going through these S3 backup based replication jobs. So context aware data mobility is really, really important. And we have a question. Are things like infosight need to help you shift your strategy? Infosight, and we'll get into a, we have a full session on infosight. It does give you uh, recommendations of what the ideal strategy on prem is. Where we desire or where we want to take it is for it to be able to give you best price performance strategy based on private and public clouds. And what it needs to learn is what are the attributes and aspects of different public clouds and how they relate to your workloads. That's the aspiration. Okay, so you, because it's obviously it's a tool set of artificial intelligence and you can do whatever you want with the data set. So I was just curious. Direct. So we use a lot of the, uh, we use a lot, so we have, so, so we, 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 what we do is in, in, at the back end of InfoSight is we run a lot of data pipelines. Data pipelines are all the telemetry data that is coming from Nimble appliances, 3 pod appliances, store once appliances, and pretty soon we're going to add Apollo servers to the same category. All that data that comes in, we use AI-based learning mechanisms, primarily deep learning, and then extrapolation on top of that to give you a recommendation. But all of that data is collected from on-prem deployments. They, they're not instrumenting the public cloud right now for our customers that are especially in the hybrid mode. And that is where we would eventually like to go. Currently, no. Currently, no. Currently, MSA uh, services a market segment uh, that is all about speeds and feeds right now. It, it's not about value add data services. That's what we have observed. Now, it could change, but what we have seen is like, you know, uh, does the customer, be, and I'm, I'm, I'm just sharing my observation here. I might be wrong. But when I'm sure, like, when we talk to MSA market segment customers, snapshots like, ah, eh, okay, good, good to know, right? Uh, cloning, we can give you cloning for test and dev. They're like, eh, don't know. Just give me some cheap storage, right? So that's our biggest challenge over there. So there is a constant debate of, you know, as you prioritize InfoSight across the portfolio, because the full stack portfolio is huge. So currently, uh, the first thing that we brought online with successful results is the three-part uh, ecosystem onto, onto InfoSight. Uh, the next step after that is SimpliVity Apollo servers, right? Now, where does MSA stack right now in that order? Probably very low, right? Uh, so from a, from a data plane perspective, data mobility and context-aware data mobility is really important to us. Like, what is your destination? What is the destination workload that you want to go to? Right? That is really important to us. So when you, when you specify the intent of mobility, the simplest form of mobility is nimble to nimble, three part to three part, primary DR. A complex mobility where we want to get to is within the entire ecosystem that we have because we service products in every segment. Three part, mission critical, nimble storage, general purpose, price performance optimized, store once, backup archives. Can data move seamlessly between them without somebody intervening? That is a first step. But then, most of our products are cloud connected as well. Store once is cloud connected, Nimble is cloud connected. Easiest way of cloud connection is replicating that data into the public cloud, into S3 or a Glacier archive. But then, how do you recover that? The only way to recover that is on-prem. This data is essentially unusable in the cloud without having a Nimble appliance over there or a store once appliance over there. So what is context-aware mobility? Context-aware mobility is that you should be able to extract that data into a cloud-native format, like an EBS volume, so that you can start to use it natively with cloud-based applications. That's intelligence. That's context awareness. That's stitching the stack together from a data plane perspective so that you don't have to think. Right? Then when a developer comes to a storage admin and asks for, hey, I want to use this data to develop a new application in the cloud. The response should not be talk to me in four months. The response should be, yeah, we'll create some EBS volumes for you there. And the right amount of data moves. And it's transformed as it moved. Then, so there's context-aware data management. And, the, and where context awareness comes from, it's not rocket science. InfoSight has been doing that for a while. We just want to use it for more intentful actions now. 
There's a very big features in InfoSight called recommendation engine. What recommendation engine is driven from, and Rochna will talk in detail about it today, is comes from context analysis or what we call cross stack analysis. So we, it actually understands this is VMware, this is SQL, this is Oracle. So now using that data which is collected in all parts of the ecosystem becomes really, it, it, it simplifies the life. So imagine provisioning a LUN on a three part appliance for your production workloads, Oracle. Then when you specify a snapshot policy, it takes a snapshot and then automatically indexes and replicates that snapshot to a store once and directs to an R-man's job right away. That application aware, backup's already done, backup window goes to zero. In addition to that, taking a snapshot and restoring it or moving it right away for test and dev purposes on a nimble appliance within the same environment or replicating it to a public cloud, right? So that is context aware data management. And last but not the least, proactive workload placement. And this is the question that was earlier asked. So combining the recommendation engine with cross stack analysis and vision based uh, data stack analysis within InfoSight, combining those two together to actually figure out and recommend which is the best place to run this workload. Then from an aspirational perspective, uh, where we want to get to or where one of, one of the deepest part of the strategy is rooted in is, so simplest form of mobility is three part to three part, nimble to nimble. Mobility that allows you or gives you hours in your day back is primary, secondary, DR automatically worked out and you not having to interfere with that, right? Where we aspire to go to is taking a data volume, extracting the right data and then populating a data lake or having the ability for a nimble appliance to start understanding modern day workloads like Cassandra or Mongo in the future, right? That is a very fundamental pillar. Like, okay, block protocol is the workload of today. Files is the workloads of the today. What are the protocols for the future? Should we speak Mongo natively from the box? Should we speak Cassandra natively from the box? Maybe should we speak Kafka natively from the box? These workloads are right now consolidated and mostly found on our Apollo servers, right? So having that Transformative mobility is something that we aspire to go towards. And then last but not the least is, okay, so once you replicate data to the public cloud, the easiest way to replicate data to the public cloud is at S3 uh, storage environment. Doug will talk to you about uh, HPE cloud volumes, which is actually offered as a service. It's an enterprise block storage service consumed in the cloud with snapshots, cloning, data reduction, compression, all these services turned on. Nimble, Nimble is able to use it natively. In future, 3 Power will automatically start to use this service as well. That's where context-aware data mobility comes in. So you can take a volume from 3 Power and then be able to replicate it into an HPE cloud volume service. And the goal on this side is to be able to use an enterprise-grade block storage service with your Azure or AWS compute, right? But make sure it is offered as a service. So you go on, create, a, create an account, allocate, and then you go from there. There's nothing to install, there's no appliance to port, there's nothing to mark from marketplace to be checked out and be put on there. And they automatically discover the data which is on prem. So if you want to replicate some data. So two use cases which is mostly being used for right now, just uh, avoid a DR site. So a lot of customers that buy 3 or Nimble on-prem, they'll buy an HPE cloud volume service on the other side and they'll just tag and replicate data onto the other side. Because if they want to fire up DR with VMware AWS, VMware environments can now be fired up in the public cloud. And a more complex type of deployment is if you want to do an application replatform, you can literally start to access your data on the other side and you're rewriting the application over there and the same snapshot is now available on the other side. This is what we call a CI-CD pipeline between on-prem and public cloud. The biggest challenge in all of that is stateful storage, right? And to be able to orchestrate that on a mobility plane without you having to think about it is one of the fundamental pillars of the strategy. So data lifecycle management, lifecycle is an overloaded word. It's been used for a really, really long time. But the amount of data that is churning and generating these days, backup has to be a feature. You know how long it takes to backup a fully loaded filer? Two weeks sometimes. Right? So to be able to do all of those things automatically without a human being involved, this is what we call table stakes. The future state is how do you enable newer workloads 
and native app development of your existing applications by using the same data, which is what we call follow the workload. So the intent of your workload should be able to be captured by your data fabric, right? Because, you know, newer NVMe will come across, and we'll talk to you in detail about that. Uh, you know, storage class memory will come through, we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, you know, newer dedupe algorithms will come by and people will catch up. But what people are not going towards very quickly is multiple tiers, multiple workloads existing simultaneously, common plane being data. How do you look at a data outcome? So we want to focus more and more on data, data outcomes, the context of data, mobility of data, and automating most of that. Whereas, you know, appliances and technologies will follow along. But the, the richness and the complexity of data is something that needs to be grappled head on. So in order to follow along, the key is your cloud volumes. Without that. As one of the destinations. Okay. Right? So you don't have to have cloud volumes as the destination. Yes, you can have uh, cloud archives like S3, Glacier, as one of the destinations. But in there, there is also a subtle difference that I want to highlight. And, and my slides, our slides don't capture that. When you recover from there, Currently, backup softwares can also put your data in S3 and Glacier and Cloud Archives. Mm -hmm. But how do you recover that? You recover that by what? By installing that media server and backup server in the public cloud. That's not convenience. Mm -hmm. That extra work. So you saved some storage, but you added the cost over there on the other side. How do you make sure that your fabric captures that maybe I just need to execute a Lambda job and then take this data out of an S3 and populate an EBS volume, native cloud volume, to be able to use that. Or, because we have pre-positioned the cloud volume service for the customer, maybe extract it from S3 or Glacier, because that's where it's cheaply stored, without installing or monitoring anything, and populating the cloud volume right there. Right? That's convenience. That's context awareness. That's the subtle difference. So how do I capture all of these things? And, I, and this is probably my second last slide as we get more and more technical from here point onwards, is context, mobility, consumption. Right? Context, what is the intent of the data? What is it that I store? How much of it do I store? Should I even be storing it in the first place? Mobility of the data. Mobility within your primary environment, primary, secondary, backup, DR, and also mobility as you change your application and workload types. You can take your existing uh, uh, latency-based optimization, and you can start to do some big data analysis for some context analysis, or maybe doing some app development in the public cloud. Mobility should be a fundamental pillar. And last but not the least is what we call, Hewlett Packard has a, has, has, a, has, a, has a lot of flexibility available through different consumption models. HP Financial Services makes it a lot of life very easy for our customers just to consume their existing infrastructure in a cloud-like fashion. Right? So combining those together and then being able to report on that metric allows you to actually calculate the ROI life between public and private consumption models. Question. So there, the mechanisms to enable this intelligence of the data, is that like uh, is it just tagging of the VM or is it automatic flag as soon as, uh, as, soon as the member sees something it goes, hey, you know, let's, let's flag it and then and brings the admin right. to, to the So I don't want to steal the thunder from the rest of the day, but we'll try to answer that. So yes, number one, the simplest way to do that is tagging of the data, tagging of the VM, uh, and tagging of the volume when the volume is uh, sort of uh, uh, allocated. The second way of doing that is, you know, NTFS, VMFS, these file system formats are no secret. EXT3, EXT4, uh, VXFS, ZFS, these are no secret, right? But these are the most commonly used file systems. HDF, HDFS data format is openly known. So there's a very simple technique called LUN cracking. <laughs> you can inspect the LUN inside to be able to figure out what that is. A lot of people don't do that, right? In order to be able to do that, your file systems need to be efficient to be, so, so that you're not spending as much time on the other thing, right? So, so not only LUN cracking, but then the ability for, so for example, uh, Rochna will get into the details of that. InfoSight is sending you know, hundreds and thousands of uh, data telemetry points back to the data center, right? Which is our data pipeline service as this data is coming in and it's cross-relating that, right? So not only is it cross-relating to your appliance fleet, but it is also cross-relating in an anonymized fashion to the rest of the uh, deployments that are out there as well. That also generate additional context. It also allows us to give you recommendations like, well, traditionally our customer base sees four to one data reduction on a SQL-like workload. You're only seeing two to one or maybe nothing, one to one. Maybe there is something that needs to be tweaked in there. 
right? And then using the same context analysis to be able to understand what is the source of the data and where does it need to go from a target perspective as part of the mobility plane. And then uh, from a, a, a portfolio perspective, one of the things that I, 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 I wanted to put forward was, so, so currently in, in the storage business unit portfolio, you will have 3PAR, Nimble, Apollo services, and store once with RMC software as, as some of the key pillars of, of, the, of the products that we run. So the design centers of, uh, of, of these products allow us to focus on various segments and various parts of and various environments or various workloads in, within the data center and then be able to efficiently cover the entire gamut of workloads that are out there. RMC is being evolved and currently being used as that intelligent mobility layer between these platforms, right? Uh, so, so, what, so 3 par is you know, six nines of availability, tier one performance, and the design center is resiliency, availability, and mission critical nature of applications, where you want that instant failover to come about, right? And, 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 and the platform itself comes with a lot of uh, configurability, for allowing customers to be able to best tune the workload for the mission critical business outcome that it needs to run at, right? From a, from a Nimble perspective, the design center of Nimble is simplicity. So basically you don't have to deal with a lot of storage admins in that environment. It is general purpose. In addition to that, price performance is one of the, com is, is, the, is, the, is, the is the design factor. Giving you the best performance for the price envelope that you wanna spend on, right? Deduplication, compression, data reduction, uh, are, are the fundamental tenets around which the, the, the persistence layer in, in Nimble is built on. And then from, a, from an instrumentation perspective, you know, obviously the journey for InfoSight started with Nimble, but now it's gonna extend to the rest of the portfolio, which basically means this entire portfolio is now developing signatures that detect your workloads, that report its own state, and then pushes it back to a centralized engine that we have. And then from a, quickly touching on the secondary portions, so secondary storage store once, basically you know, next generation of store once appliances just came out. Uh, the goal for over there is to add that data uh, archive tier or data protection tier on prem, right? And then using RMC as a seamless layer that joins right now 3PAR, Nimble, and your data protection tier in your environment, right? And last but not the least, you know, and we'll go into details with Apollo servers these days. This is what we have now come to see as the as the corner store of enabling customers to run their big data workloads, right? So one of the biggest uh, uh, aspirational journeys that we are on with uh, with Apollo servers is to be able to detect the application signatures that register with with Apollo servers, and then being able to report that back into InfoSight to be able to tell you. The, again, the classification of different workloads that a customer is running. So all the way from mission critical, general purpose tier one, price performance optimized, mode two workloads for your deployment models, and then all the way down into the stack for data protection and recovery. And all of the platforms are cloud enabled, right? They're stitched to the public cloud. One of the biggest emerging trends that we see in, in our environment, and I'll just blow this out, we're seeing a lot of evidence from our customers where primary storage is separating out between tier one and operational. And how do I define tier one and operational? Tier one meaning if that goes down, somebody gets fired, right? And then operational is test and dev, file shares, general purpose storage. It goes down, people are concerned, but quickly come back up. But the and, and sub-millisecond latency and acceptable latency, right? But what we're seeing is an increasing trend of operational backup archive all collapsing into secondary, right? And that's where, and we're seeing a lot of our customers now starting to use, you know, store once and Nimble interchangeably. And the advantage that you get with, with using a technology like Nimble uh, in, in, in a general purpose secondary environment is that you get the speed of your backup dramatically go up, but then you can restore right then and there. Because it, within itself, it's a primary storage platform, but very price performance optimized for the needs that you have. All the way from AFAs, all flash, down to deep hybrids with deep dedupe running in them, giving you the price performance that nearly match, matches the, the disk to disk, the backup tier. Right? So, and, and this is very supremely positioned to be able to take advantage 
of this primary storage stack being collapsed within the data center. How do you handle object based storage? Currently, we use uh, object based, uh, I'll just quickly revert to that. <laughs> right. So, uh, currently, uh, we, for object based storage, we use our partners, Scality. Uh, to, to, to offer an end-to-end -end object based lakes to, or data lakes to our customers. Uh, Scality partners with Apollo servers on our portfolio to give you that single SKU, but all the consumption based model services, all the support services come along with that. Uh, currently from the portfolio, as you saw, natively developed by HPE, we do not have a native uh, object storage service. But for, from a customer's perspective, your interface is HPE, HPE financial services, HPE storage, to be able, when we partner Apollo with Scality together, to give you that uh, object-based experience. And so from, from, a, from a data mobility perspective, RMC, again, is able to take existing storage platforms that we have and hook it up to any on-prem object storage uh, data lake as well. So again, that mobility plane comes in. But what RMC does not have right now, and I just want to clarify, is it does not have context-aware intent capturing that I was talking about. But that's a fundamental pillar of our strategy where we want to take it towards. The, the fabric is stitched, but it doesn't understand that it's moving to HDFS, or it doesn't understand that it's moving to uh, uh, cloud-based native storage. You have to specify that. It needs to get it automatically, because it can from InfoSight. Blob storage in the cloud at all? Is that a growing trend from your customers? So what, what we see is, so here's, a, here's, here's something that I, that I, that I found out. Because there's always that misconception that net cloud, cloud could be cheaper. Right. So c cloud storage can be cheaper if you don't use it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you throw it out there and just leave it, that's fine. Right. 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 Gets and puts can get expensive very, very quickly. Oh, yeah. Right? So that is why that, that economic awareness, the question was earlier asked, right? Does, does cost-based recommendation come into InfoSight? So when we ex want to extend and instrument InfoSight between on-prem and your cloud-based workloads, we actually want to tell you your gets and puts out of the Glacier or S3 is costing you this much. Right? And, and that is where that context aware mobility fabric completes itself. Right? You're asking all the right questions. Right now, we tell the intent, and then we tell it to execute the intent. The beautiful thing is everything's connected. But you want the human out of the way. You want to be able to say, SQL, this is my protection, and these developers use it. Done. Should be able to take a snapshot, move it to Nimble, create clones, clean out the clones. Tear that down, move it to Glacier, store it, DR, fire it up into a cloud volume on the other side. That is the intelligent fabric, which we are very close to. Right. So with that, uh, uh, but th th that was all what I was going to cover. And then from here on, you know, we can start to get more and more into details on primary storage, secondary storage, big data storage, and some of the other topics of today. Before you go any farther, do you have a percentage of number of people that have migrated to cloud and then came back and said it was too expensive and they want to come back? We, I, I, can, I can give you... Coming from a hardware vendor, I wouldn't believe you if you said 97%. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's not, it's, not, it's not that, it's not 97%. What we have seen is customers that went to the cloud in a, in a lift and shift fashion, I would say 70% of them came back out. 70? That's what we see by the amount of volume of servers moving. What, what was the, uh, now are you talking just storage customers or compute as well? Or compute as well. Okay. Right? But what we... What we for that? Was it just cost or...? Primarily cost and unchecked consumption. Hmm. Mainly improper plan, right? But, but I would say of those 70% of, those of the customers, the larger ones, actually are now going through an application reclassification exercise. Mm -hmm. And so what... They, so they still want to use it, they just didn't know how to use it. Exactly. But what I also see, but, but, but what I also see is that this trend of cloud first is also not reversed. I will also share that data point. Like when we engage with our customers, the first question off the shoot is, is this cloud compatible? Yeah. Like that thing hasn't gone away. So they're learning what the best practices are. So for us to be able to uh, work seamlessly with these guys, that is why the fundamental cornerstone of the, of, the, of the data fabric, of the policy, 
of the data mobility, context of our data mobility is the public cloud. And you will notice I keep stressing one thing again and again. We don't want to put our storage appliances, whether virtual or physical, in the public cloud because that negates the use then. Right? We want you to use native S3, EBS, you know, PaaS services in the public cloud. And the fabric needs to connect directly to those things. It's certainly a different model though, because I mean you you see VMware saying, no, you should run VMware so you don't have and to. And you should run vSAN. Yeah, so you don't so you don't have to relearn the <laughs> right. native cloud tooling. And but I, I agree with your approach more. I mean, in my opinion, the the same guys that would take that approach took the I don't want to learn VMware five years ago. And exactly. now they don't work here. So exactly. Right. And 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 See, when you want to go to, if a lot of people, so, so the 70% the people that came back, you know, one of the clearest learnings over there was, I am managing SQL here, why am I managing SQL there as well? So the common question is, everybody's being asked, like when Microsoft engages with the customer, they'd love to sell you as much IaaS and, and Azure services as possible, but they, what they really want you to use is SQL Pass, like, like the, the analytic services that are offered as a platform. Right? So in order to have a better seamless journey with our customers, we have to take their sources of data and connect it to those PaaS platforms and save them the physical and the manual labor of doing R sync, restore, transform, feed, and then being productive 20, like 20 years from now. Right? We don't want to do that. So that is why the context awareness of the mobility fabric is one of the fundamental design principles in the forward-looking investments. We have linked it, but what it lacks, and I'm openly saying it, but where's all the efforts going to go towards other than you know, NVMe, staying competitive, we have to do those table stakes. But where we feel we can leapfrog the market is by defining that intelligent fabric that understands the destination of your data. That's about it. That, that I'm going to dive head first in the cloud. I mean, you obviously saw it with the 70% going back. It was, oh, we're going to, going to go to the cloud, and then right. you realize, oh, that wasn't what it was all cracked up to be, now I'm coming back. Right. Um, I, I, could, I could see the software really basically helping you plan that strategy, because right. you really do have to plan it. You can't just jump head first into it. Right. And, and the data has to conform to that outcome. Right. That's the hardest part. See, compute is stateless. Yeah, you can't manipulate data. Excel spreadsheet where you right. can, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you, right. you, you can make it look like anything right. you want. Taking a block LUN and populating a data lake is a hard problem to solve. We're intent on solving that. Taking a LUN and allowing it to use as EBS on the other side is a hard problem where we, we're intending to solve that. Or, or go close to Omer. Uh, that's fine. <laughs> I can repeat the question. <laughs> yeah, I, I was just going to re repeat a point that you made earlier that I think is really important, in the, at least in the context of big data, and that is data gravity. Because when we look at these cloud compa cost comparisons, sometimes the focus gets too much on pricing. And, and what, I, what we see is you really got to look forward uh, because as more data goes out to the cloud, everything else is going to go out to the cloud too. And, and that, you know, sometimes that makes sense, sometimes it may not make sense. Right. But you got to look forward and think about the implications of data gravity. Right. You kind of touched on right. that earlier. Like one of the fun, like you, you, when you said planning, when you said that spreadsheet manipulation, see, every vendor will tell you, even we will tell you, we know what we store, just pay a bunch of professional services. Right? But I, I challenge this. A, a lot of customers, like, I asked this question, there's so, storage has been, it's like the highest value business, big margins, has been around for a really long time, but nobody has answered the question. What is it that I store? How much of it do I store? Should I even store it in the first place? Why? Exactly. Why am I doing this? Right? It's always about terabytes and petabytes and in this tier and my AMC is 40 terabytes. My NetApp is 70 petabytes. Okay, well, what is that in store? Stuff. Right? That, is, that, that is what we want to answer from the intelligent fabric, from InfoSight instrumentation, from connectivity across the entire portfolio. And because of the balance sheet of HPE, 
which is pretty rich, we afford a portfolio across the entire stack. So it's a real opportunity to be able to show a holistic picture and then be able to extend it out. So from, from, that, from that insight, let's say you do see somebody has a thousand copies of one particular spreadsheet. What happens with that then? That so, uh, you know, so let, let me, let me, right, let, right, so, right, so it gets deduped, yes. So, 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 but, right. so, so that's a, so that's a very, the, that's a very loaded question, right? So I just want to technically classify that. So copies of a spreadsheet is, is a, a nested layer of intelligence that we intend to develop, but, you know, let's start with the LUN, right? type of a LUN, what does the LUN do? So yeah, so if there is a multiple copies of that SQL LUN, a, a, a work that we, we are investing in, and you'll see over the next couple of months updates coming on top of that, is this concept of data, data lineage, right? So the SQL LUN, it has got 25 copies, or it's got 30 copies, and these snapshots are continuously being taken, and let's say there's no expiration policy on top of that. The, the InfoSight connected fabric should be able to come back and say, Nimble Cloud Volumes can offer you this. Do you accept? And when you accept, all those sequence of operations should just happen. Right, because a lot of the times, even if you tell the information, then like, what's next then? Yeah, great, great to know. Can somebody do anything about it, right? That's the hard part. So, so right now, it does the intent. The intent is not automated. And the intent is getting InfoSight connected, but then the intent needs to be executed. That's the mission. So, speaking of that, with all the, the functionality that you guys have and all the drive being to make all this data that's on-prem accessible as block storage or file converting to cloud volumes, is the intent to also be able to allow that data to come back? In Absolutely. The same format? Absolutely, and because that's where the hopefully. The, I mean, hopefully, as we're as we're getting more intelligent with our applications and, and retooling everything to go microservices or to go distributed, we would drive that back internal as well, right? And would end up probably consuming a lot more development internally that's running on the same block storage, that's running on the same object storage, right? Um, but that we can basically shift our workloads right. internal the same way that we can in the cloud. But is that functionality going to be there from the beginning? That functionality is there right now, okay. but it's manual, right. it's not automatic. Okay. It detects the workload, but right now it doesn't detect the destination. Sure. And we know uh, the destination. As far as like converting from cloud volumes, you could bring it back to Absolutely, that, that, that works volumes. today, okay. that part works today. Right? Bringing it back from EBS yeah. does not work today. Okay. It should work pretty soon. Well, what I think about your story is that uh, you can keep the lights on, you can yes. keep the plates spinning, yes. because you have the continuum an on-premises and cloud, right. and the ability to start refactoring your data. Yeah. Whilst so the primary is still running. Exactly. Yes. yes. So that's, that's the challenge, because you're not just looking at re-architecting applications, right. but you have to look at the data consumption models and what you know paradigms are involved, yep. because you got retooling it. is not easy in, in any level. Yep. <laughs> cool. That's all I have. Thank you, guys. Really appreciate it.